I'm Steve Hartman. Happy New Year, and thanks for joining us for this special. We're going to revisit some of our favorite stories from 2019. Every week, we travel America, talking to regular folks, looking for the extraordinary in the ordinary. We hope you find these people, young and old, from all walks of life, as inspiring as we do. We are always amazed at the impact young people especially can have. This first example is the best example. At a nursing home in Northwest Arkansas, we found a gem named Ruby. As we first reported in March, 11-year-old Ruby Chitsy likes to go to work with her mom. Amanda is a nurse who travels to several nursing homes in the area, and it was on one of those visits that Ruby started going up to residents with her notepad. If you could have any three things, any three things, what would they be? What would you want? She came up with this idea of these questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. With the intention of what? I don't think she had an intention, really. Ruby says she was mostly just curious what they'd say. Were you surprised? Yes, I was very surprised. I thought people would say, like, money, houses, Lamborghini. But instead, here's what she got. Electric razor, new shoes, Vienna sausage, for some reason, a lot of people asked for Vienna sausage and other really basic items. Like, that's all they wanted. And I really decided that I needed to do something. So she started a charity called Three Wishes hey, for Mary. Ruby's Residence. I'm going to sit Hello, right Ruby. beside you. Now, while her mom is caring for patients, cheese. Ruby goes room to room. I love mm -hmm. cheese. I do too. Jots down wishes. Avocados. And then sets out to grant those wishes. Thank you, sweetheart. You're welcome. Ruby has a GoFundMe to cover costs. But again, no one is asking for a sports car here. Her expenses are minimal, especially compared to the rewards. It really lifts you. It really does. On this day, she came back with a wheelchair full of sausages and other grocery items. You have this huge chocolate pie that you can eat all by yourself. But oh, make no awesome. mistake, this yeah, isn't about cool. food. Watermelon and oranges. No. no one has this kind of reaction over fresh fruit alone. It's okay. Thank you so much. I can't believe it. Whether she knows it or not, Ruby is satisfying some much more basic human needs here. To be remembered, to be cherished, especially by a child. That is what our seniors are truly hungry for, and that is what Ruby brings every time she sets foot in a nursing home. And now, it's not just her. Since we first told this story, Ruby has helped start chapters of her charity in other states. She speaks to advocates for the aging, and of course, she is still very much hands-on, proving no one needs a Lamborghini. You know, I'm a hugger. When they've got home delivery mm -hmm. of all the happy they can handle. If you or a child you know is interested in granting wishes like Ruby, you can go to 3wishes.global. That's the number 3, wishes.global. And there you can get tips from Ruby herself about how to get started and do this in your hometown. Ruby has certainly made a big difference by going above and beyond. And so has the gentleman in our next story. His name is Curtis Jenkins. He's a school bus driver, but his impact goes way beyond the steering wheel. You can see why someone might hate being a school bus driver. The early hours, when the weather sours, the abundance of responsibility combined with the absence of eyes in the back of your head. Y'all have a good day! Nevertheless, Curtis Ooh. Jenkins loves delivering these little ones to Lake Highlands Elementary in Dallas, Texas. Yes. Emily Grunninger is the principal. He goes way beyond the outline responsibilities and duties of a bus driver. I mean, that bus is like a family. These are my children. These are my community. I love them all. To establish community, What's your job, man? he starts by giving everyone responsibility. This is one of the police officers. It's an elaborate flowchart. She's the administrative assistant to she's the president. She's administrative assistant to yeah, the president. She's, yeah. Everyone working together to build a yellow bus utopia. And we're going to care about each other and we're going to love everybody, right? I put time, effort, love, care, understanding, understanding each and every one of those kids. Omar. To show his love and understanding, hey, Chief. Curtis gives presents throughout the year. You say you like baseball. Each gift personally selected with that child in mind. Hey. He gave this girl a t-shirt. Her first book. With a picture from a book she made. I'm hoping this t-shirt inspire her to keep on writing books. 
Over the years, he has bought these kids bikes, backpacks, handed out cards on birthdays, and even turkeys at Thanksgiving. He has spent thousands out of his own pocket. And yet, if you ask the kids what they like most about Curtis, the gifts don't even come up. He really cares about us, is really kind, and he helps anyone in need. Ethan Engel is a fifth grader. It means a lot to you. Yeah. He says the bus ride is often the best part of his day. My mom got divorced when I was only four. I'll see you tomorrow. He's the father that I always wanted. In some ways, I just, I wish my dad could have been like that. We make the mistake sometimes of thinking certain jobs are more important than others. I know. But Curtis Jenkins made his job important. Right, and in doing so, bye -bye. even created his own salary. Bye -bye. That's the paycheck right there. If I can get that, you can keep the money. <laughs> Since we first aired this story in May, Curtis has gotten a big promotion. He still sees the kids all the time, but he's no longer a bus driver. Instead, he's what they call a relationship consultant. He works with other people in the district, teaching them how to have the same bond with kids that he has. Obviously, Curtis knows a thing or two about community, but even he could learn a thing or two from the neighbors in our next story. At the far end of Islington Road in Newton, Massachusetts, lives a little girl near and dear to the neighborhood. Two-year-old Samantha Savitz is deaf, but boy, does she love to talk to anyone who knows sign language. Her parents, Raphael and Glenda. Yeah, she's super engaging. She wants to, you know, chat up with anybody. Yeah, her whole personality changes when it's someone who can communicate with her. Likewise, if someone can't, well, that makes Sam just a little sad. Her desire for engagement has been painfully obvious to everyone in the neighborhood. Whenever they see her on a walker in her yard and Sam tries to be neighborly, they find themselves at a frustrating loss for words. I didn't know what to say back. Wouldn't you like to talk to her? You know, basic conversation that one would have with a child. Asking her about her day. And make her feel that she is part of the neighborhood. Just be her friend. Unfortunately, this isn't something you can solve with a casserole. You'd need the whole community to learn sign language, just for a little two-year-old girl can't expect neighbors to do that. You can only appreciate them when they do. On their own, Sam's neighbors got together, hired an instructor, and are now fully immersed in an American Sign Language class. The teacher, Reese McGovern, says this is remarkable because a lot of times even the parents of deaf children don't bother to learn sign language. But here, Sam has a full community that's signing and communicating with her and her family, and it is a beautiful story. And he says this level of inclusion will almost certainly guarantee a happier, more well-adjusted Sam, which is why her parents say there aren't words in any language to express their gratitude. It's, yeah, it's, it's really shocking and beautiful. We are so fortunate. In fact, they say they're already seeing a difference in their daughter. You should see her when she comes in at the end of class. The first thing she says to us is, friend, I think your heart would melt just as mine did. Sometimes it feels like America is losing its sense of community. But then you hear about a place like this, where the village it takes to raise a child is alive and well, and here to remind us that what makes a good neighborhood is nothing more than good neighbors. Since we first visited Newton in February, Sam has celebrated her third birthday and the class size has doubled to 40 students. Kudos to Reese, the teacher, for making that fun. We learned many times this year that a good teacher can make a huge difference. Got many examples of that. The best one, though, is probably this story from Colorado. Classes here at Axel Academy in Aurora, Colorado have been out over a week now. But for middle school math teacher Finn Lanning, there's one student he just can't shake. 13-year-old Damien. Do you know how many pencils I went through this year? Like way more than you should have? Yeah. Damien says Mr. Lanning was definitely one of his better teachers. 
When like a teacher doesn't bother me over and over again, that's better. Okay, you have a low bar. Yeah, <laughs> like leave me alone, I'll leave you alone, I'll get my work done. He's smart and funny, um, and he was always a student that stood out. And then one day he just came to me and said, I'm not coming back to school. Finn sat him down at that table right then and there. And what I found out was his story. He learned Damien was in foster care, that he had kidney disease, and because social services couldn't find a foster family willing and able to meet his medical needs, Damien had to leave school and move into a hospital. But here's the real kicker. The kid needs a transplant, desperately. And a lot of times you can't get a transplant if you don't have a stable home to return to after surgery. It hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, you just can't sit across from somebody that you care about and hear them say something like that and know that you have room to help. And that's how Finn became a foster parent. He took in Damien, dialysis needs and all, even though prior to that hallway meeting, he'd been a confirmed bachelor who delighted in his childlessness. I never thought that I could leave school and take one of them with me and still survive, right? Damien says, right back at you, bro. I was like, yes, I'd get out of the hospital, but I was like, my math teacher out of all the people. <laughs> <laughs> now, four months into it, oh, yeah. neither one of them would change a thing. <gasps> Although Damien says he's not getting too excited just yet. Rematch? He's seen fairy tales fall apart before. It's kind of bad thinking about that, but some people actually do that. Like, they'll like just kick you out, one, they'll be happy with you one day, and they just kick you out the next. I suppose only time will let you trust. Yeah. Whether he believes it or not doesn't change the fact that um, I'm not going anywhere. This is it for him. Yep. In fact, Finn says he plans to adopt Damien as soon as possible. Is that enough pepper? In the meantime, and much more importantly, because of Finn, Damien got back on the transplant list and just a few hours ago got his new kidney. For a child steeped in disappointment, this is shaping up to be the best Father's Day weekend ever. A new kidney and a dad by his side. Although Finn says that dad title, that's going to take some getting used to. That role it has such meaning attached to it, right? And it's not that I'm not willing to do it, but it feels like you have to earn it in some way. You did. <laughs> Earned it. I hope so. And epitomizes it. That's my favorite. I love that one. We're happy to report that today Damien's kidney is doing well and the adoption is almost complete. Here's hoping that 2020 is just as good to this new family. We'll have more of our favorite stories from 2019 right after this. I'm Steve Hartman. Welcome back. We're looking at some of our favorite stories from 2019. Now, if you're having a hard time getting motivated to go back to school or work after the holidays, the gentleman in our next story just might help you with that. When you reach a certain age, just getting down to the driveway can feel like a full day's work. But for 97-year-old Benny Facito of Perth Amboy, New Jersey, overcoming those stairs is just the beginning of his workday. What the whole time is up here? Two days a week, he clocks in for a four-hour shift. There it is. His job? Oh, good morning, hon. Fag boy at the local stop and shop. See that? Yeah, nice, I do it. Benny used to be a warehouse supervisor for a cosmetics company. Thank you. You're welcome. He supposedly retired back in the 80s, but he's been doing odd jobs ever since because he says he loves a hard day's work and always has. What was your first job you ever had? Who, me? Yeah. A shoe shine shop. We had a shoe shine when I was young. At what age? Seven or so. So you shined shoes, then what did you do? Then I go home. No, what was your next job? I went to barber school. Okay. After that, I went to the Army. Benny served in the Army Air Force during World War II. He was a gunner on a B-25 Mitchell bomber, flying mostly over Northern Africa and Italy. Today, his Italian casualties are far less consequential. <laughs> but he still approaches his job with that same tireless, warrior-like determination. For example, Benny says he'd sooner stack a honeydew on white bread than loaf around on the job. 
I don't take no breaks. No breaks? No breaks. Benny will not take a break. Never? Never take a break. That's the boss man. Mike Moss is the assistant manager. What if you went up to him right now and said, Benny, it's break time? He'll yell at me. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that the hard way. I don't want it. Take I a break. Take a load off. I don't want to stop. Don't tell me how to work. See the light on? That's where I'm going. When I pressed Benny on this, he said something really interesting. He said, why would I take a break when I only get to work four hours? He actually put it that way. I only get to work four hours. As if bagging groceries was some kind of privilege bestowed upon him. I get a feeling that I did something good. Mm -hmm. You can't just stand around like an idiot. You have to have a reason to keep alive. You're welcome, sir. For Benny, that reason is to go out and earn, not just a paycheck, but a purpose. He says you need to contribute at all times and avoid breaks take a break. at all costs. You go sit down. No, I don't want to sit down. Yeah. Benny celebrated his 98th birthday in August with a party at, where else? The Stop and Shop. He has had quite an interesting life. But even Benny would be amazed at all the twists and turns in this auto mechanic's career. I really want to be a doctor when yeah. I grow up. Whenever his two little girls play doctor and dream of becoming one someday. Let me take your heartbeat, doctor. 48-year-old master mechanic Carl Allenby is flooded with the feeling of deja vu. You wanted to be a doctor? Oh, yeah. But that wasn't realistic. Not where I came from, no. I grew up in East Cleveland, which is a very impoverished city. We were on welfare, and I remember the powdered milk, government powdered milk and uh, block cheese. And because they were so poor, young Carl quickly set aside his professional aspirations and focused instead on becoming the best auto mechanic he could be. So this was the parts store where I got all my customers from. So you would work on cars in the parking lot of the parts store? Oh, yeah, sometimes till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Eventually, he got his own shop, and for 15 years, he did okay, until one day he decided to ratchet things up. In 2006, Carl enrolled here at Ursuline College. His intention was to get a business degree to help him manage his repair shop. But there was one hurdle, a biology class. He couldn't understand why he had to take it, and he put it off as long as possible. I'm a business major, yeah. what, what do I even care about biology? But I went to class and in the first hour of being there, I knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. All those ideas of wanting to be a doctor just came rushing back. And to make a long story short, the car doctor, Dr. Carl Allenby, is now a doctor, doctor. Daddy, we love you! Last spring, Carl graduated from Northeast Ohio Medical University. And today, he's an emergency medicine resident at Cleveland Clinic Akron General. Hey, Miss Fior. By all accounts, Carl is already an exemplary doctor, partly because, according to his supervisors, he works so long in a garage. That cannot translate. You'd be shocked, actually. I think it's some of the customer service. This is Dr. Rebecca Merrill. But could you imagine right now going and learning auto mechanics? No. <laughs> but Carl said he'll do our oil changes, so. <laughs> Fortunately, Carl now has more important repairs on his mind. But this old auto mechanic also knows that whether you're working under a hood or staring down a hatch. Can I have you open up your mouth or otherwise? Your success hinges on your drive. I would hear people say, well, Carl, it's going to take nine years to become a doctor. Yeah. And I'd say, well, nine years are going to pass anyway. So I'd rather be someplace I want to be than someplace that I could have been. And there's the prescription right. yeah. for the I can't do it blues. And if that doesn't motivate you to kickstart that New Year's resolution, nothing will. Now we go from a doctor with the world at his fingertips to a little boy in a world all his own. Aside from immediate family, no one was allowed in the house to see three-year-old Quinn Waters of Weymouth, Massachusetts. And more importantly, Quinn wasn't allowed out. We basically keep him in a bubble just as a precaution. Even a cold, a common cold, could be something that will bring him back into the hospital. Parents Jarleth and Tara say Quinn's natural immunity was temporarily wiped out after he got a stem cell transplant to treat his brain cancer. We are Italian. Fortunately, the kid is a fighter. 
And as we first reported a few months ago, he kept a mostly positive attitude. Do you want to drink or anything, dude? No, thank you. But it still stunk. He sees all of this happening, and he knows he's stuck inside. Um, and there would be days. Days when Quinn was literally pounding to get out. Unfortunately, staring out a window is a poor substitute for walking out a door. Quinn's connection to the outside world has been limited to whoever passes by, which hasn't been all that limiting, actually. It started off with family members, like, come to the window. Then the neighbors started showing up to entertain. The police caught wind. And pretty soon, top-notch performers were just showing up on Quinn's front lawn. It's turned into like a vaudeville stage out there. <laughs> yeah, the window kind of became his window to the world, yeah. you know? It got so you never knew what might happen by. One minute, it could be a dog parade. Look at that dog. The next, a team of Irish step dancers. Everyone brought together by word of mouth and a will to help Quinn get better. Which his parents say did start happening. It's the positive energy from all these people that we believe has gotten him through his, his sickness, you know? You can never repay, you know? Just maybe pay it forward, you know? Being indebted never felt so fortunate. Come on without, come on within. You'll not see nothing like the mighty Quinn. After this story first aired in August, things got even better for Quinn. What are you doing? Light years better. Trick or treating? By Halloween, doctors had released him from home confinement, and free to be a kid again, he rushed outdoors at warp speed. <laughs> you can't outrun your shadow, buddy. He also got to drop the puck at a Boston Bruins game, felt the sand between his toes at the Massachusetts shore, and yesterday, saw the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade pass by. There is no greater curse than cancer, but no greater blessing than beating it. Quinn continues to make progress and gets stronger every day. And his parents have already started to pay it forward. They just donated a truck full of toys to Boston Children's Hospital. So that's our special. We hope this helps get your 2020 off to a great start. We also hope that you'll join us for more stories like this every Friday night on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Until then, have a healthy and happy new year. Good night.